how's it going everyone? Welcome to Found Flix. On this inning explain, we're looking at Night Swim, where a family moves into a new home, unaware that a dark secret from the house's past will unleash a malevolent force in the backyard pool. Yep, a haunted pool movie. Now, you know, a few years back, the idea of big time horror producers James Wan and Jason Blum teaming up might have been exciting, but if Night Swim is in the indication of what we'll be getting from them, eh, I'm not so sure. Honestly, it's not even the PG-13 rating or the wacky concept that is really the problem here. It's mainly that the movie is just so generic and boring and doesn't even lean much into its crazy haunted pool concept. It's more like a family drama with some kitty safe jump scares every now and then. And the whole baseball of it all. There's so much baseball in the movie and I'm like, why? There's especially this one drawn out sequence during a baseball team tryout. I'm like, this is a haunted pool movie, not a haunted baseball field movie. There's not gonna be anything scary going on here. And there isn't. Anyway, this one is definitely a miss and learning that it is based on a short could be the culprit. As typically when shorts are expanded to feature length, they have to add a bunch of fat to even reach 90 minutes. And that is certainly the case here. So let's take a dip with nights. Swim, breaking down the story, what the Timigami deep water is all about, and explaining the ending. Back in the summer of 92, at a seemingly innocuous house, there lurks a dark secret. The pool water gurgles, and a light blinks under the surface. A small toy boat crests the surface, slowly chugging along. A young girl, Rebecca, is awoken by the noise, and tells her ill brother Tommy that she's found his lost boat, and she's gonna go get it for him. The boat is somehow on the bottom now. There you are, she whispers. She fetches a pool skimmer and tries several times to retrieve the toy, getting perilously ever closer to the edge. A force yanks on the pole and she is dragged into the pool. She sees what looks like her mom while underwater, yet when she reaches the top, no one is there. The light starts rhythmically thumping in the pool and she paddles back to the edge. That pesky toy boat pops back up and she goes to claim it once more. She keeps reaching for it, yet it stays just out of reach. Once she finally gets it, she is tugged into the water. A voice chanting, Demogami, which means deep water, broke catching a glimpse of what looks like a bunch of ghoulish onlookers. Moments later, the girl has vanished, only her bunny slipper left behind. While we don't know the full story yet, it's already obvious that that water is bad juju. Years later, we meet the Waller family, who are adjusting to a new way of life after Ray was forced to retire from playing baseball due to an illness. He still struggles with this, listening to an announcer on the radio droning on about a game, and Ray is overcome by a loud ringing in his ears. His fam asks if he's okay, and he insists that he's fine. He just needs a few minutes. They go to take a tour of a home, and the realtor rattles off about how great the neighborhood is. The realtor K knows about his previous career, asking if he's going to bring his famous Waller swing to town once he's feeling better. He and his wife Eve both chuckle, and he says for now that he's focused on getting better and spending time with his family. They drive through the town, seeing kids playing, people watering the yard, pretty much a picture-perfect snapshot of suburbia, or a living hell if that's not what you're into. Another house randomly catches Ray's eye, and they take another tour. This one isn't a rental. It only has had one owner in the past couple decades. Suspicious. It's even in the same school district that Eve is going to start teaching at in the next semester. Eve finds Ray outside, lingering over an old rundown pool. She thought for some reason he was scared of pools. Really? Who the heck is scared of pools? Water, maybe, but I don't know, it's not quite the same thing. He corrects that he's always wanted a pool and even used to sneak into a rich neighborhood to use theirs as a kid. His kids complain of being hungry and when going to leave, Ray spots something in the water. A torn up baseball. He strains to reach for it and topples right into the water, getting ensnared in the cover. He's overtaken with a vision of him back at the bat. The announcer details that after years of battling his illness, Ray is trying the impossible with a major league comeback. He smashes the ball and hits a home run to massive applause from the crowd. Back to reality, he struggles his way out of the water and his family run to his side, seeing that he did snatch that baseball. It sounds like he's still a little bit obsessed with playing baseball again. They pay a visit to the doctor and learn that Ray's condition has progressed despite them previously thinking it had stabilized. The doc tells him to forget about baseball, but try out some other low impact exercise like walking or yoga, or you know, maybe even swimming. Ooh, that's a great idea. The doc tells him to use a wheelchair for the next few days, and Ray is unhappy with his situation. He doesn't want to be this sick guy anymore, feeling that his illness defines his whole life now. Instead of baseball, he suggests moving into that house. It's got lots of room and a swimming pool. Water therapy right in their backyard. She sighs that she has always wanted to put down roots for years, but had to keep moving due to him getting traded all the time. Well, sounds like he sucked at baseball too. She wants the house as 
well as long as he truly wants it too. He promises that he does, and smirks, asking if she still has that black bikini of hers, getting a slap for being fresh. Oh, these are well-drawn characters. We're launched right into a song about swimming in the summer, appropriately enough, as the family gets settled in. The kids respectively have their first days of school, and Elliot is hopeful about trying out for the baseball team this year, confident that he's about to get his growth spurt. His mom bends down, joking, oh, I think you're hitting it now. Oh, <laughs> mommy. Also, Carrie Condon, what the hell are you doing here? You were just nominated for an Oscar for Banshees of Inishirin, and now you're in Night Swim? Sounds like you might want to fire somebody. Izzy is quickly sought out by another boy, Ronan, wanting her to try out for the swim team. Everybody's on the freaking team, apparently. After seconds of interaction, Izzy is already goo-goo over her new acquaintance. The pool itself needs some serious work, too, as it's dirty as shit, and it also boasts a stanky smell. L brings up his tryouts, and his coach wants Ray to come along to show off some pointers. It's gonna be our year, Dad, right? He asks, hopefully. Ray agrees, but it's not exactly convincing. Uh, yeah, sure, you little pipsqueak. It's a completely different tune when it comes to Izzy and the swim team. He's all, oh yeah, you're gonna nail it, girl. He reaches down the drain, and something slices the heck out of his hand. The drain starts gurgling out sludgy water, leaving them wondering if it is safe. Well, what do you think? No. They get a pool guy to check it out, and he reveals it is in fact a spring-fed pool, as in it is tapped into groundwater. Spring pools like these are said to work wonders, and there are several wellness centers and spas in the area that use the same. The family then get to enjoy some frolicking and fun in the water, set to another song about pools. Didn't even know there were so many. Already, Ray can feel the water helping his muscles, and he starts thinking that maybe all this happened for a reason. He wouldn't have ever walked away from his career if he was still healthy, and Eve warmly tells him that he'll always be a boss player, but that's not all he is. This is all we need, right? Yeah, we love families. Yeah, he smirks. Still not quite believable. This dude really wants to get back to hitting some dingers. This is made abundantly clear when he unpacks his old baseball stuff, staring longingly at his own card. He unwraps an old camcorder, seeing footage of the family years ago having a pillow fight. What do I choose? Family or baseball? Ugh, the struggle. It's Eve, who takes our first official night swim of the movie, took long enough, their cat Cider keeps whining at her, and then scampers off, seeming agitated. She returns to doing laps, and at one point sees Ray above, looking haunted. She laughs that he scared her, but of course he's not there, it's just the pool showing her things! The lights begin to pulse, and she quickens her stroke, exiting the pool. As soon as she's out, the lights return to normal. Dodge a bullet there. Later, Cider is up on the diving board, and the lights begin going wacky once more. The toy boat pops out, and we hear Cider meowing in distress along with growling emanating from the waters. The next morning, the family, in particular Elle, are horrified to find that the cat has gone missing, and they split up in search of him. Inside, Ray unwraps his bandage, and shockingly, his hand injury is completely gone. His hand looking good as new. Thanks, Magic Pool. Ray and Elle work together to get the pool cover out, Dad pushing him with coaching motivation phrases like, don't give up, keep going, or whatever. They get the pool covered up, hearing echoey voices emanating from within. Eve then has a dream of her trapped in the pool, and she wakes up startled. Looking over, she notices Ray isn't in bed, seeing that he's out taking a dip at 3 a.m., another night swim, also looking much more healthy in his movements than before, as though the water actually healed him. Hopefully there's no strings attached. Another trip to the doctors backs this up. They do a bunch of tests for his hand and breathing and all that kind of jazz. Even on the treadmill, he cranks his speed up several notches. Afterwards, the doctor is beside herself. She's never seen such a dramatic improvement so quickly. He chalks it up to a new diet and water therapy, of course. We have a pool, he smiles crookedly. The kids come home from school, and Elle wants to take a swim. His mom tells him to ask Ray, and he heads out to the garage where he has made a shrine to his old career. Kind of sad. A tape of him is playing, giving out batting tips, which then cuts to the family playing, implying that he taped over this for his baseball baloney. Kind of a jerk. He shyly asks his pop to come die for coins. Mom saying he couldn't go alone. Ray asks him to hand a coin over, drawing a smiley face on him, and tells him to promise that he'll stay in the shallow end. Oh, so he's just straight up negligent too. That's smart. The boy plays on his own, and while underwater, a coin falls in. He swims up, assuming that it was his dad there, but nope, he's never there. He hates you. He shrugs it off, and another coin clinks in, followed by another and another, seemingly luring him towards the drain. He grabs the coin, and hears a voice saying, hello, spotting Rebecca there. He rises up, triumphant that he got them all in one breath, but still no one is around. He comes out by the diving board, and something slams it hard, noticing someone standing above. He takes a peek, but you know the drill. 
A voice emanates from the side, asking, can you hear me? She cries, I need help, I'm looking for my mom. Elle swims over, and he asks her name. It's Rebecca, from the opening. She says she's found his toy, spotting his action figure in the drain. He reaches in, and appears to get stuck. He pulls on it hard, seeing something hair-like tangled around his arm. He gets it loose, and a swampy, dark hand lunges for him. He backs away, seeing glowing eyes that descend down in the depths. Well, that's not Rebecca, who the heck is that ghost, uh, bloaty ghost lady? He runs to tell his mom, who storms out looking for someone. She asks if he's sure of what he saw. Yeah, it was this girl Rebecca, saying she was looking for her mom. She discusses this later with Ray, and he thinks that he's just pretending, pointing out that he doesn't have any friends yet. She encourages to give him some time, and he invites her to come to practice too. He always plays better when she's there probably doesn't even give a shit if he's there. The time comes for him to try out, and it may be worse than we thought. Mom asks if he knows what baseball is, right? She surely must be joking. Elle moans that this stuff comes so easy for Dad and Izzy, but Eve informs him that everyone is scared of something, bro. Ray shows up late, and the kids are all excited to meet him. It goes quite well, with the other kids easily improving their game after seconds. It's finally Elle's turn at the bat, and he manages to crack a line drive. Hey, good job, kid! The coach asks Ray if he's up for hitting a few, and he mumbles that he's not so sure. They egg him on, and he can't help himself pulling out a bat like it's freaking Excalibur or something. Coach sends the ball down and Ray whiffs it completely, grumbling that he needs to warm up. Pitch two doesn't fare much better, him even falling on his ass. He insists on another, and at home the pool begins to bubble. That vision floods in of his comeback, and he takes a crack, obliterating the ball, and launches it into the stratosphere. The kids all cheer in excitement, and L looks bummed. Once more, it's all become all about his dad and his baseball, completely ignoring his kid who just wants his attention. The parents head off for a night out, leaving Izzy in charge. She uses the opportunity to invite her crush over, blackmailing her brother to keep his trap shut. They take advantage of the pool for a little match of the classic Marco Polo. It's a real gas of giggles and awkward teenage flirtations. It's then her turn to find him, and he slinks under swimming to the deep end. He then climbs right out of the water. Hey, cheater! Her complaining that he's supposed to say something back. The radio crackles off, and a voice growls, Polo! The thrumming returns, and she heads into the deep end. There, the top of a head pops out and growls polo again. At least the ghouls know how to play by the rules. She reaches a hand out, getting closer. I know you're right there, she says. It's an old dude with a beard and sunken eyes. Just about to make contact, they dive underneath. In the water, we can see something amongst the flashes. She puts her head under, a green goblin motherfucker appearing. Polo! And what the hell is that supposed to be anyway? Looks like a freaking pickle for a head with googly eyes. What is going on here? She thinks it's Ronan for some reason, cursing him for the prank. She swims deeper and deeper, going impossible possibly deep, well below the, you know, eight feet of the pool, she can barely make him out, and then he vanishes, leaving her in a massive dark expanse of water. The ghoul guy is back and grabs at her leg. She counterattacks, screaming, and the dude just lets her go. Okay, then. She sees the surface is incredibly far away, implying this deep water is in fact some kind of supernatural plane of existence extending beyond the physical pool. She makes it to the surface, and it's clearly disturbed. She asks if that was him down there. Nope, he's been here the whole time, and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Izzy's parents come home to her surprise, sending her beau to leave in a hurry. He gives her a smooch on the way out, telling her he'll see her at the family pool party this weekend, leaving her eyeing the water suspiciously. Later, Elle attempts to talk to her about it, and she only opens her door when he returns the favor of blackmail. Though she only says she got stuck in the pool cleaner, nothing else, he knows that she's lying, and she silences him. Things have been going so much better since they moved here. Does he want to upset that and maybe make them have to move again? Besides, does it make more sense that the pool is helping or haunting them? He proposes that it could be both and she shuts him down. No one will believe you anyway. Haunted pool. Pfft, ridiculous. The time for the big pool party arrives and it looks like the whole neighborhood showed up. While the others are out having fun, Elle sets up his dad's camera to monitor the action like a tiny Jimmy Stewart. Outside, Ray is looking for his boy and runs into Ty. He found the ball that he had smashed during practice and asked him to sign it. Ray is happy to oblige, telling him to hang on to that. It's going to be worth something someday. Whoa, you are pretty deluded, huh? Distracted by his dreams of baseball again, he asks Ty to play a game of chicken against some others. Again, literally completely forgetting that he was looking for Elliot in the first place. Man, this guy's uh, got ADD or something. I don't even know. Eve has some questions for Kay regarding the house, and why hasn't the pool been used for such a long time? Kay tries to downplay it, but is obviously hiding something. This lady must suck at poker. She claims that she didn't know it was the same house, but spills about what happened to Rebecca. Eve is bowled over, but especially so after asking if her name was the same that her boy mentioned. Yep, you got a certified haunted pool on your hands, lady. The game of chicken becomes more intense. As the battle rages above, Ray looks kind of stuck under the water. Ty tells
tells him to let go, and Ray only tightens his grip. Black goo shoots from the drain, entering right into his mouth, and we see dark swirls taking over his eyes. The pool's evil got to him. The kid is still whimpering to let him go. Ray grabs hold even harder and starts backing towards the deep end. The toy boat passing overhead. Elle sees the commotion going on, and no one else in the pool seems to notice at all. Yeah, just keep drowning the kid. We're just gonna be splashing over here. His dad dives in and collects his boy, while Ray is still under the water in a daze. When they do pull him out, he's unresponsive, but thanks to Eve, he chokes back awake. They discuss the matter with the police later, and Eve argues that Ray didn't mean to hurt anyone. It's all just because of his condition. But the damage has been done. Ty's mom telling them to stay away from her family. Well, so much for that big welcome to the neighborhood. This is enough to convince Eve to round up the family and get the heck out of here. Convince something is wrong with that pool. Ray vehemently disagrees, feeling the pool is the best thing ever. Pool's getting his brain. She's confused. Uh, don't you remember you almost killed a kid and drowned himself? Oh yeah, right, right, that stuff. Baseball? He caves to come with, yet as soon as she starts driving away, Ray begins painfully hacking and coughing. There's blackness flowing through his veins and he spits up some black deep water. This forces them to not leave the home, the doctor is saying to let him rest and recover for now. He wakes up at one point, weakly apologizing for what happened, and is worried. He doesn't know what's going on with him anymore. He grabs her arm, tensely asking, just for one more swim in the pool, jonesing for the water like an addict or something. He smiles wearily, dreamily saying, it's so cool in the deep water. So cool in the deep. <laughs> All the weirdness sends Eve to another potential solution, draining the pool. Although I'm not sure draining it into the storm drain is the best idea, as that would spread the deep water into the city's water system. Eve checks in on her kids and has a heart to heart with Izzy. There's some story that Ray told about feeling a profound strength at the bat the moment that she was born, but yeah, that means that he was playing baseball while Eve was giving birth. God. As she says, she was surrounded by strangers and felt completely alone. She didn't even think she could keep pushing and worried about her being a good mom. Izzy somehow must have felt how scared she was because suddenly she was there and Eve didn't feel alone anymore. She tells her as long as they are together, they'll never be alone and promises that nothing bad will happen to her. Your brother on the other hand, who gives a crap? Guys, a dud. Eve does a Googler and finds a story about Rebecca, but it's not only her uncovering many more drowning victims over the years. A call to Kay connects her with where the Summer family lives now at a massive gated estate, seem to be doing pretty well for themselves. Lucy answers the door and once explaining that she lives in her old house, she lets her in. She shows off some photos probably of her son Thomas, who she says is doing important refugee related work. She calls him her pride and joy. It's him that's responsible for this home, but complains that he doesn't visit enough. When she inquires about the house, Lucy chuckles, what a special place, and Tommy sure loved that pool. Eve asks if she had a daughter too, her fibbing, ah, no, just Thomas and I. She explains about her situation with Ray, thinking the pool made him better, but her and the kids have also seen some weird stuff. There's something bad in the water, right? Lucy has a sudden coughing fit, and she cranks an oxygen tank to no effect. Eve then spots a fountain weirdly in the middle of the room, certainly tapped into the deep water. She helps herself to a glass of water, overfilling it, and the water weirdly retreats into itself. This ain't your regular water. Lucy goes on to explain the idea of a wishing well, while well, some water is actually magic, blotting some black liquid leaking from her eye. Even before there was a house, there was a spring in the ground. Back in the old days, no one knew what was beneath the surface, but came to understand that it could gift them their deepest desires. People must have worshipped it when they found out its power, the Timagami. Deep water. There is naturally a catch for the water to grant your wish. You have to sacrifice someone to the Timagami. Gummy. Someone's gotta pay for the water to keep giving as it gave to her. In her case, Tommy was so sick and he's killing it now. Well, what about Rebecca though? Lucy coldly says that it was better for her to be the sacrifice. It's more humane for a child not to know what's coming. Yeah, it's definitely more humane to allow your daughter to be murdered by evil water so you can get a selfish wish. Humane and good parenting too. It's just running rampant in this movie. We go back to that night and see the full disturbing story. Tommy weakly rises in bed shouting for his sister. He tries the door, finding it locked. Meanwhile, mom stares out the window, the blackness weeping from her eyes, witnessing the whole thing. She says the water used her as a vessel to do what needed to be done, basically possessing her to facilitate the sacrifice. The whole idea being that Ray will get his wish to have his big comeback and beat his health problems if he makes a sacrifice to the water. Just as she 
she was able to save Tommy, but at the cost of Rebecca. Lucy justifies that love requires sacrifice, but Eve counters, that's not love, and it's not a sacrifice if you get something in return. She brings up that the spirit of Rebecca is still looking for her mother, and appeals to her that she can still help if she wants to. Lucy starts really feeling her sickness, collapsing to the ground, and the black goo begins filling up her tank. The fountain turns black. It'll all be over soon, Lucy croaks with a wheezy chuckle. The water will sleep again, and someone else will find the house, starting the process all over again. At home, Ray is in the shower, and the deep water starts seeping into the empty pool. He starts choking, and his bones snap, the evil taking full control over him once more. The kids come home later, searching for their parents, finding the house oddly dark and seemingly empty. Elle grabs a glass of water, seeing it rippling within the glass, meaning as feared, the spring water has seeped into the water supply, maybe even into the whole town. Elle hears something nearby, and hopes, impossibly, that it's Cider come home. He runs out excited, and the glass starts sliding across the counter. He scans around the pool, hearing a distinct cat meowing, along with a whipping tail scene in the pool floor. He climbs out onto the diving board, carefully crawling ever closer to the edge. As he leans down, the pool starts flashing, and the crank on the cover activates itself. He strains to reach the float, and when he gets a hold of it, it's empty. A skeleton lady appears, popping the inflatable, and he tumbles under the water, getting trapped under the cover. Izzy runs out to help and fights back against the crank, but it's too strong. Her mom joins in, and they work together with much effort to crank the cover back open. Eve dives right into the waters, knowing her boy needs rescuing fast. She swims down to the remnants of the inflatable, shoving them out of the way. Down in the deep void, through the darkness, she sees something there. She goes back to the surface to put a hose in place to give her an extra jolt of O2, even though that wouldn't work at all underwater. Inside, Izzy slips right on the broken glass, shards digging into her flesh. She hears a low creaking elsewhere and scours the house looking for her dad. He appears behind her, growling, there you are, hidden in the darkness. She asks him what's the matter, seeing a pool of blackness looming towards her, and he vanishes. She freaks and tries her phone. Ray tosses her away, growling, don't do that! Eve keeps swimming and swimming, reaching the end of her hose line, and gulps down a few hits of impossible oxygen before venturing deeper downwards. Izzy tries to break through to her possessed dad. They need to get him some help! He counters that he has already found some, the darkness dancing within his eyes. He asserts that life is too hard for Elliot, and it's better for him to just die so that he can get his wish. He grabs her by the hair, and she breaks free of his grip, losing a clump in the process. She runs off, and he casually calls after, Marco! Eve is really in the deep waters now, coming to Elle floating there. She grabs a boy and furiously starts swimming towards the surface. The various pool spirits appear, trying to hold her down. They tug at her leg and claw at her from every side. Izzy gets to the garage, pounding on the door for help. She hides behind some stuff and waits for her dad, hearing him whisper, Marco! He pops up over the side, startling Izzy. You're supposed to say Polo! Eve is still swimming and can't find her way back to the surface. Rebecca appears, shaking her head, no. She opens her hand, revealing Ray's smiley face coin. The water world turns upside down in a needlessly slick shot. She's been going the wrong way the whole time. The ghouls are all around them, and now she can see the top. She changes course, now on the right path thanks to Becky. She gets him out, and Eve begins CPR as Evil Ray approaches. He tells her it's too late. Love requires sacrifice. She pleads with him. They need to get Al to a hospital. The boy needs his help. He cruelly grabs her by the throat, lifting her high into the air. He croaks the water chose him. He freaking loves that pool. He assures her that Elliot will always be here, joining the peanut gallery of watery spooks. Izzy surprises him with a bat to the knee, causing him to hack up more goo. She gives him one more to grow on in the arm, flashing through relevant memories, hammering us over the head with the movie scenes about fighting and sacrifice and Elliot needing him and whatever. You gotta fight, Ray! A high-pitched ringing takes over and he vomits up a pile of darkness, now back to his normal, not as evil self. He does at least finally have a moment of self-reflection. It's me, he understands, and profusely apologizes to his family, treated like shit for who knows how long. L comes to, spitting up water, the spirit still reaching towards him. A big smoky darkness fills the pool, and L starts getting all messed up by the water. Ray knows that it's not going to let him leave. Someone has to pay. He purposefully walks back into the pool, the goo seeping out from the drain. He tells the fam not to look back, and strokes right into the storm cloud of evil. As he is consumed by the darkness, Elliot is immediately healed. The water has been given a sacrifice, and is pleased for now. Everyone looks on wondering, where's dad? But the point is, he finally did make an actual sacrifice and put his family above baseball for literally once in his entire life, which also cost him his life, ironic. After his death, the family click on the camcorder to a schmaltzy beyond the grave message from Ray. He sighs that he doesn't know what's going to come from all this, but he feels that he has something to prove. He just wants to make the family proud and admits that baseball is easy for him, but the other stuff, not so much. So not being a selfish asshole,
goal is impossible, I guess. He does seem to want to at least try to care about his family, wishing he had a way to show them how much they mean to him. Ending with a big smile and a hearty, I love you. The family now seems oddly closer than ever, as though it's better that Ray isn't around anymore. She hands over the smiley face coin, asking if it's her boys. Ah, now you can have a memento to always remember that time when your dad preferred to go pump some iron on his own rather than go swimming with you. Thanks, Mom. She offers that they could go anywhere now, you know. But the kids are worried about this happening again. Eva's got that under control by filling up the whole dadgum pool with concrete. Good luck using that again, chumps. The deep water burble satisfied in its offering and is dormant. At least in the end, Ray did actually do something to prove himself to his family and finally put him above his baseball career. Too bad it resulted in his death, which, uh, you know, maybe actually for the best for the family, kind of. So things are okay now for the family, but I was really anticipating a credit scene of some kind paying off on the deep water getting into the regular water supply. This would spread the evil throughout the whole town, potentially unleashing a massive amount of doom, but nope, just ends with no mention of that outside of that one glass of water. Ah well, that'll do it for this ending explained, but why not check out this video over here? Don't ever click away. The water has you now. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.